with uh, James Wilk, and he's going to tell us about uh, constraints on the fundamental physics and molecular group. All right, uh, thanks very much, Andrew. That's the first time anybody's called me doctor in a formal setting before, and that was a joke. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me here. This has been—I've only had a few meetings so far today, but they've been excellent, and I'm looking forward to meeting with some of the rest of you over the rest of the day. So yeah, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the local group. So uh, I'm going to start with a little outline. So I'm first going to—if uh, you are not convinced that the local group is interesting, I'm hopefully going to convince you that the local group is interesting and, and explain what the local group is for those of you that are unfamiliar. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two specific examples of uh, my work at, at trying to constrain physics using the dwarf galaxies of the local group. Specifically, constraints on cell feedback from local group dwarf galaxies, and then constraints on the earliest epoch of star formation and reionization using uh, local group ultraviolets. So I'm going to start with a, a guide to the local group. So I define, uh, or the local group is defined as the Milky Way and Andromeda, two spiral galaxies. And then the, uh, the, the satellites either around them or in the field around here. So this is from a simulation of, this is from the fire simulations of basically a Milky Way and Andromeda-like system. And you can see that in addition to these two spiral galaxies that dominate the, the, the mass potential, there are also lots of little subhalos around that are filled with stars. And then also galaxies out in the field. Um, and this is what I study. Now, if we look at the actual images of some of the dwarf galaxies in the local group, we'll see that there's a huge diversity in the galaxies in the local group, all the way up from like LMC mass type things, which has a stellar mass of a few times 10 to the 9, all the way down to these incredibly small ultra-faint dwarf galaxies that have thousands or even hundreds of stars in them. And what you can see is that just from this, you know, images here, uh, the, there's six orders of magnitude in stellar mass, right? So there's a huge population of galaxies, and we can study galaxy formation processes in this huge range of stellar mass. Okay. In addition, these very small things, as I'm going to talk about in the second half of the talk, these incredibly small things are some of the are the smallest galaxies that we know of. And so, really, we could be studying the limits of galaxy formation when we look at objects. Uh, finally, as you can probably tell, one of the other great things about studying the local group is that we can see these objects in resolved stars. So you can actually pick out individual stars, measure their velocities, how they're moving, their ages, their colors, and you can learn a little bit or learn a lot about how to combine that, that, those stellar properties with galaxy formation as a whole or the process. Um, and so these are some of the things that I'm interested in using the local group to understand. Uh, first is dark matter physics. So because we're studying the smallest galaxies that exist, we're also studying the smallest halos that can form a galaxy, right? So you can learn a bit about uh, dark matter physics this way. This is something that I know Andrew is interested in among some others in the audience. Um, and things we can learn potentially are what are the mass of the dark matter particles? What is its interaction cross-section with uh, either itself or uh, normal matter. Uh, I'm not actually going to talk about that at all during this talk, but uh, it's something that I am interested in. So if you are also interested in it, please talk to me about it. Uh, what I am going to talk about is the early universe of ionization physics. As I mentioned before, we can uh, uh, ask what is the threshold of galaxy formation, which we think, for reasons that I'll explain later, is, is caused by reionization and actually causes this threshold of galaxy. Um, and also, another very interesting thing about the universe, uh, local group is that it contains both the galaxies that we think sourced a lot of the UV photons that reionize the universe um, in some of the larger dwarf galaxies, and also galaxies that are impacted by reionization. So this UV background heats up the gas around small dark matter halos and maybe prevents gas accretion onto them, or maybe wipes out the gas from inside of those halos entirely. And so we can study both of those processes and that interplay between the galaxies that source reionization and the galaxies that are impacted by reionization is something that I'm very interested in. And then uh, I'm actually going to start at the end uh, talking about feedback physics, specifically how does stellar feedback impact galaxy formation. All right, so I'm going to start with this plot. 
Uh, this is from Baruzzi, 2013. This is the stellar mass to halo mass ratio of halos of different sizes as a function of their halo mass. And the different lines are halo masses measured by a bunch of different processes, by a bunch of different people, but they get roughly the same result. And it's that star formation efficiency is quite low at the cluster and uh, elliptical galaxy scale and increases down to about the Milky Way mass scale, right, where the star formation is most efficient. And then it dips off again toward higher masses. And we think this plot cuts off at about the LMC scale, but it, it definitely continues going down as you go lower in cell mass. Okay? And we think this dip at, high, at lower masses is caused by supernova feedback. And the way that this works is quite interesting, and it's helped us to actually look at a, 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 a video of one of these forming. I'm a galaxy formation theorist, so I'm required by law to show a movie of the galaxy forming at some point. And so this is a dwarf galaxy about 10 to the 10 in halo mass, and a bunch of weird stuff is going to happen at high redshift that I don't understand. And then eventually something is going to start coalescing. Right, right about now, you're going to get this central object which is dominating the gravitational potential. This is the gas, by the way, colored by its temperature. And what you'll see is as this thing is forming, uh, you'll see little, little puffs, right? And these are supernova feedback events, right? So a supernova goes off in one of these star particles and it blows out gas. Sometimes they're quite weak, like that one right there, it just kind of moved some gas out a little bit. And sometimes they're huge, they're absolutely enormous, and they blow out huge amounts of gas, or maybe blow out all of the gas entirely. And what this ends up doing, so there's a pretty big one right there, um, and what this does is it affects the star formation rate of the galaxy. So this is the star formation rate of halos of different mass from the fire simulations. Um, so this is a, a spoiler alert for later. This is a 10 to the 9 solar mass halo. And you can see that it's only allowed to form stars prior to reionization. And that's something that, that, that deals with this threshold of galaxy formation that we'll talk about later. And then uh, once you go up another decade in stellar mass, or halo mass, to uh, the halo mass of that video that I showed you, about 10 to the 10, you see this very bursty star formation where it you know, goes up, it forms stars, and there's a bunch of wiggles in this line. And, some of those smaller riddles or some of those smaller feedback events were just sending out a little bit of gas. And then there are these huge drop-offs where the star formation rate drops to basically zero. And we think this is caused by those huge blowouts. And they're actually blowing out all of the gas in the galaxy, right? They completely stop the star formation. And what this does overall is makes the average star formation rate of this galaxy quite low. Now you go up another decade in mass to the LMC scale. And you can see that there's pretty large wiggles, but you're never blowing out all of the gas. You're never completely just destroying this galaxy, this gas. And then you go up another decade in stellar mass to the Milky Way scale, 10 to the 12. You can see that it's relatively steadily forming stars, except at early times when the halo mass was pretty low. Um, and what's happening here is pretty, pretty simple. You have some stable gas disk, which is forming stars. And then a supernova goes off and blows out some of the gas in that disk but there's still star formation going on elsewhere in the disk, so you're never able to completely disrupt the star formation of this galaxy. And this results in this plot. This is similar to the Beruzzi plot that I showed you at the beginning, but now it's just stellar mass as a function of halo mass. And you can see um, things are only allowed to form stars up to this you know, baryon fraction times their halo mass, right? And nothing ever gets that high, but the closest is Milky Way mass galaxies, because they have the most highest star formation efficiency. And then it dips off in the LMC scale and then into the dwarf galaxy scale. Right? So not only can these uh, uh, the supernova events affect the gas and therefore the star formation rate of these galaxies, we also believe that they can impact the dark matter distribution within these galaxies. And so what this is, is this is a density profile of dark matter in a 10 to the 10 solar mass halo, so a dwarf galaxy halo, as a function of radius. And this is from a work by Yorbe et al, 2015. And what they did was took a dwarf galaxy, simulated it with dark matter only, so no galaxy formation physics at all. And it simulated again a couple times, these red lines are from simulations with uh, galaxy formation in them. Okay, so you have supernova. And this black line is the dark matter only. You can see that the density profile rises basically to the, the very most inner regions of the dark matter halo profile. But in these 
uh, in these simulations with actual supernova feedback, the, the central densities are lower quite a bit. And the reason why we think this happens is, once again, kind of elegant. It's basically if you allow the gas to get dense enough so that it dominates the local gravitational potential, when it's then blown out by a supernova feedback, it drags the dark matter with it. And, and, and repeated bursts over time can lower these central densities. Okay? Um, now I'm going to take this opportunity to define a parameter. Um, often we quantify the slope of this dark matter halo profile in central regions by fitting a power law at some radius, maybe 1% of the real radius or something, something very close to the center. And then alpha gives you the slope of that power law profile. So this thing that's very flat, we call it a core, and it has an alpha about zero. And then uh, a, a, a typical NFW profile or something that uh, is not cored uh, has an alpha of about minus 1.5, roughly. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, what happens is that these bursts in star formation actually kick dark matter out, right? They're gravitationally dragged out by the gas. And this happens on relatively short time scales. So this is from a work by Karina Badri, where among plenty of other things, he looked at the response of the dark matter halo to one burst of star formation. So this is the specific star formation rate of a dwarf galaxy as a function of time, and this is a very short amount of time, but there's a you know, short burst of star formation, and the corresponding dark matter halo, the, the halo distribution actually flattens out quite a bit in very short time scales. So this is like 400 million years. Right? So this response is very quick. Now this is good that we get this core formation in theoretical galaxies because we have some evidence that real dwarf galaxies look like this as well. This is some rotation, uh, H1 rotation curves from Survey. So you can measure how H1 rotates in galaxies and for dwarf galaxies, some of the smaller galaxies, like DEO 126 and 43, you can see that the rotation velocity as a function of radius is quite low in the central regions and is lower than this black line, which is an NFW profile. So it's better fit by a Burkert profile, which is one of these core profiles, right? Now I say we have some evidence, this looks pretty definitive, but some people have argued that this isn't, and what you're seeing here is not actually tracing the dark matter profile. Uh, the gas is actually heated by some, by feedback or something like that. And so what you're seeing here is not actually tracing the dark matter profile. It's tracing just, it's a little bit heated, though, more heated than that. So some people would argue that this isn't actually evidence that these things are core, but you know, other than that, there's this correspondence between the, the what you see in the dark matter halos from simulations and what you point to toward in observation. Um, if you look at dwarf galaxies as a population, or at really galaxies as a population, and look at their core formation, this is the plot of the alpha parameter uh, versus stellar mass to halo mass ratio. And so what you see is that low stellar mass to halo mass ratios, like you would expect for like the ultra big dwarfs, some of the very smallest objects that we know of, uh, you get NFW profiles. And then higher stellar mass halo mass ratios is like the Milky Way. Um, you once again have an NFW profile. But in the middle, there's this sweet spot where you get this very intense uh, region where there's very large cores, right? Now, so it's basically zero. And this is once again from simulation work, not only the fire simulations, but also the Nihau simulations. They show a similar rise in stellar mass halo mass ratio. And once again, if you try to compare this to data, what we have from like H1 rotation curves, this is this alpha parameter as a function of R in, which they define as the, the innermost radius at which you can actually well measure the rotation profile. And this is from the Nihau simulations, which are simulations, uh, and then data from little things. And once again, they prefer alpha around zero. Okay. So I want to look at something a little bit different, not really look at the dark matter. It's very hard to observe dark matter. But um, I wanted to look at something different. I wanted to actually look at the response of stars to these feedback events. And so, at least in simulation world, the way that the dark matter and the way that the stars are modeled in the simulations are actually quite similar. Uh, the dark matter is collisionless, at least we hope real dark matter is somewhat collisionless. Um, and also stars are quite collisionless. So if we believe that uh, the dark matter should be dragged out by feedback events, by these gas becoming unbound, then it would make sense that the stars are also affected in a similar way. And so I've returned to this plot from Kareem Al-Badri's work, 
And I've now reinserted the middle plot that I cut out the first time I showed this, which is the response of the stars to this person, the star formation. Because okay? it's purely gravitational, right? Hmm? This is purely gravitational, right? Yes. Yeah. And so what you can see here this is the average radius over this burst time. So when this burst happens, the star is also vibrating further out. And it's quite a large difference. It's basically the average radius is 2 kiloparsecs before this burst and then 4 kiloparsecs after. So they move out by basically a factor of 2. So they're strongly affected by these feedback events. And I wanted to look this at a little, uh, at, in a little bit more detail. So what I did was I took uh, simulations from the fire uh, simulations and uh, specifically looked at the region where we believe core formation or these galaxies are most affected by supernova feedback, so 10 to 10 and 10 to the 11 halo mass. Um, and if I zoom in on that part, this is what the stellar mass halo mass ratio looks like of our sample. And this is some simulations that I've run and also some simulations by Alex Spitz, a, a, grad student, a former grad student at UT Austin. And what I wanted to look at specifically is the age gradients of these stars. What is the distribution of stars as a function of radius? So what I've done is just the simplest thing and said, plot the positions of the stars and then color them by their age. So purple is young and yellow is old. And I might be able to convince you, might, that the younger stars are more centrally concentrated. Right? You're all convinced? Yeah. All right. Which I was done. Um, OK. Yeah. Actually, this is a terrible way to do this. Right? Um, but I can bin this, right? And when I bin these stars and then color by the average age of the star in each bin, um, this gradient pops up a little bit more clearly. And you can see that the stars in the inner regions, this is basically bin stars colored by the median age of stars in the bin. And the inner regions are younger and the outskirts are older. And this is quite, uh, uh, this is present in basically most of the dwarf galaxies that we look at. Um, I could go a little bit deeper because I have the simulations. Instead of just plotting median ages, I can look at the stellar distributions um, in these bins. And so what this is, is the cumulative distribution of stars as a function of time. So uh, the star formation history of stars in each bin. And now the, the color is the radius, the distance of the bin from each center. What you can see is that the stars in the inner regions, the more purple lines, form later than the outskirts or at least contain stars that form later than uh, the, the, the stuff in the other the, 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 the kind of track, they, they all the all, all the top, they follow each other. So you get to the end, and it's sort of optic in the star formation yeah. of the younger in class, yes. the younger ones, but the, the more centrally concentrated ones. Is that, is that cervical? So I think um, what is really happening here is this this is tracing really the most recent star formation because those stars have not yet had time to migrate yet. So if there's active star, most of these galaxies that we're looking at are actively star forming at redshift zero. And so you would expect those stars to all end up in the center for reasons that I'm going to explain. Does that drive then the trend, the degrees? Um, it, it influences it in, in in a certain way, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Yes, more questions. Now, equally, I'm not sure I would expect this, but maybe it's the way you've done it, is that the, the curves all seem to have the same pattern. They're like self-similar, right? Yeah. So this is where you're sampling the age distribution, or? Um, so there's a little bit of the fact that we only have finite snapshots right. in here. But it's also like, if you see a burst, you see it in all of them. And it's because, over time, these stars get mixed by various mechanisms, and, right? And so like stars that end up at, uh, stars that form in one big yeah. burst, like you see right here, are going to end up throughout the galaxy, so but in relative different populations. They're all correlated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So all the bits are correlated because gotcha. things are mixing one time. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm now going to, uh, I want to look for trends. I want to try and bring this back to this feedback idea, right? So I'm going to focus on the median age gradient. So I'm going to go ahead and cut across this distribution at 50% and then plot what the median age in each bin is as a function of radius. And when I do that, we get a pretty uh, obvious gradient here. So this is the look back time in each bin as a function of radius. And I'm going to further measure the slope. So this is this gamma 50. And this is, uh, for this galaxy, it's minus 2 gig years per half mass radius. So you can read that off pretty simply. And what it's telling you is how much younger stars are in the inner regions at the center of the galaxy than at the half mass radius. So for this galaxy, it's about two years. And so I'm going to look, I'm going to try to 
take this back to this feedback mechanism, and the mo most obvious way to do this is to plot that gradient versus stellar mass table mass relation ratio, right? And remember, there was that very clear and obvious trend with core formation, where things didn't form cores at lower masses, and then form really large cores. So we were hoping for something very obvious like that. And you plot it. This is just a scatter plot. Um, there's no real relation here, which was very irritating. Um, and so we went, I hate it when science doesn't match your preconceived notion. Um, but, uh, so we wanted to look at if there was anything that this correlated with at all. And one thing that we did find is it correlated with the overall formation time of the galaxy. So this is this median age gradient, the slope of the median age gradient, versus the median age of the whole galaxy. So on average, how, uh, how it's earlier, how late we started. <coughs> And so galaxies that formed later had flatter age gradients, and galaxies that formed earlier had much larger age gradients. And this was interesting. So now I want to explain this with physics. And so the first thing, the thing that I want to make sure doesn't happen is that the stars actually formed at the radius that they end up with, right? That somehow the galaxy is getting smaller with time. Um, and so what I've plotted here is basically uh, the half-mass radius of young stars, so the half-mass radius of stars that just formed, divided by the half-mass radius of all stars currently in the galaxy at that time, as a function of time. And what you can see is that this parameter is about 50%, basically at all times. So what this is telling you is that stars are forming toward the center of this halo and then being migrated outwards by some process, and we're hoping that it's feedback. So to look at this another way, um, what we can do is now uh, try and see if there's a trend with the actual core formation in the galaxy. So what I've done here is return to this plot and strength of the gradient versus average age of the galaxy, but now color these points by the, uh, the, the ratio of the dark matter density at, uh, in the hydrodynamic simulation versus the dark matter only simulation. So uh, one would be an NFW profile, doesn't have a core in it, and zero, purple, would be having a strong core in the dark matter halo. Okay? And what you can see here, once again, there doesn't really seem to be like anything here, which I was very annoyed by. Um, but there are a few contaminants to this relation, right? The first is these very small galaxies. So we're simulating dwarfs, so there are some galaxies that actually don't form a core, right? Because they don't form enough stars in them relative to their halo. Right, and I've included them in that previous plot, so those would contaminate that relation. Additionally, we have mergers. So this is one of the galaxies in my sample uh, at redshift basically one, and you can see that it's just about to have a pretty significant merger. Um, this galaxy specifically brings in about 17% of its stars in this, just this one merger. And so what I've plotted here is the star formation history of both objects, the, uh, uh, the the in-situ stars, so the stars that formed within the host halo. And then the blue distribution is stuff that came in in that accretion. And what's happening is you have these galaxies that both have extended star formation histories, so when you smash them together, what it's going to do is going to mix their, star, their, their stellar populations, right? And eliminate any potential age gradient that was in this galaxy. All right? And so if I plot this strength of the gradient as a function of fraction of stars that were accreted. You see that there are these pesky things that accrete a lot of their stars and have flat age gradients. And it's because when you smash these galaxies together, it mixes their star, star population sufficiently. And it completely disconnects any relation between uh, whether or not these things have a population gradient and whether these things were affected by uh, supernova feedback. Okay? So I can remove those contaminants, the things that had two feet low star efficiency, star formation efficiency of the form of core, um, and things that had too many of their stars brought in by mergers, and I actually end up eliminating most of the points up here. And you get this somewhat clear trend where you have these things that have strong age gradients and formed early and uh, don't have cores in their dark matter halo profile. And other galaxies that have flat age gradients form later and have strong cores in their dark matter. And what we think is happening here is that the supernova feedback at late times acts a lot like mergers and actually effectively mixes the stellar populations. And so if you have late star formation, you are mixing your stellar populations due to feedback and flattening out the age gradients. Okay? 
Um, this gets even stronger if you look at a later parameter parameterization of star formation history. So instead of looking at median age, I'm looking at the 90th percentile of youngest stars. And when you do that, this, this trend gets a little bit more obvious and stronger. And then I'm going to return to this initial kind of annoying plot where I plotted the strength of the gradient versus stellar mass tail mass ratio. And I'm not going to remove those mergers and those things that are low star formation efficiency. And, and you can kind of get this relation here, where things with low star formation efficiency have large age gradients, and things with higher star formation efficiency have uh, flat age gradients. And this kind of mirrors what you see in the alpha, where um, things uh, at around minus three don't really have all that much evidence for cores, and then it kicks up very sharply toward minus two, and that kind of mirrors what we're seeing in the cores, okay, in the, or in the cellular. So the question you might have is, well, do actual galaxies look like this? And the answer is, maybe. Um, and so uh, the problem is it's, it's very difficult to, nobody has done a, a lot of work in compiling what is known about the age gradients in dwarf galaxies. So there are a few uh, potion stamp works where they've looked at different populations in a couple galaxies. The closest we can get is this work by Hidalgo. Uh, where they looked at a couple of dwarf galaxies of local volume and broke up their stellar populations as a function of radius, and then asked what's the star formation history in each of those bins. But what you can see is R1, the closest bin to the center in each of these plots, is shows evidence for late time star formation, and then as you get further and further out in ra a radius, the star formation rate drops to basically zero. So these things do have star formation history gradients. Yes? This is just CMD kind of analysis. Yes, yeah, CMD population thing. And uh, uh, the outer radius shows basically no evidence for late time star formation. And so there, you definitely see these star formation history gradients. But whether or not there's some trend with formation time or anything like that, you can't really say anything with four galaxies. And so hopefully, uh, in, you know, in the near future, we'll be able to measure the stellar populations of the galaxies in the local group well enough to really figure out if there are population gradients and whether or not it correlates with formation time like we see. Well, it's only well mixed in the event that it had strong late time star formation or a merger. So other than that, okay, so I would argue, I would argue it's well mixed in the early time. It would be well mixed formed and then it's all over and then the stars are just going to dynamically evolve in the galaxy. Sure. But then, so then we have to explain that the fact that these, so like galaxies like this have actual population gradients, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm staring at that. Right, this is not, uh, you, you know, it, like I said, there is some evidence. Um, and what's one problem with this is these are, um, uh, uh, a lot of these are satellites of the Milky Way, so they did not, they wouldn't have necessarily all that much late time star formation to begin with because they're satellites of the Milky Way and had their star formation truncated by the Milky Way itself. So you really need to look at, like, isolated, the, the dwarf regular is basically outside the and those galaxies do show metallicity gradients, so there's more metal-rich stars near the center and more metal-poor stars toward the outskirts. Um, but there hasn't been so much age gradient analysis yet. All four of those are isolated. Are they? Yeah. Wow, thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've just talked a little bit about um, so how supernova feedback shapes the stellar distributions in galaxies. And uh, so now I'm going to talk about a slightly different one. And this is uh, the role of reionization in shaping the light of the group. Okay. So I'm going to start uh, way back in time, going way back to like the year 1999. Um, and I'm going to talk about the missing satellites problem. So once we started to get uh, sophisticated simulations of like Milky Way dark matter halos um, and their subhalo populations, and then try to compare them to the observed galaxy distribution, which is here on the right. Well, you see on the left here, this is from a dark matter only simulation, you can see that there's a ton of substructure right throughout the, the halo. But if you look on the right here, um, 
there aren't so many galaxies, right? So there was this mismatch between the two, and this was a huge problem for a while. And one of the solutions that popped up was that it was reionization. So as I kind of mentioned before, there's this idea that reionization should limit accretion onto dark matter halos above a certain mass. So uh, particularly early works on this process um, uh, pointed to a maximum circular velocity of about 30 kilometers per second for this uh, process to sort of kick in. And uh, 30 kilometers per second, so this is the Vmax is basically the maximum of the rotation curve. So it's a prox proxy for mass. And you can kind of see a, uh, a rough uh, correlation between Vmax and mass here. Um, and so this came from early theoretical calculations. But then when we started to get hydrodynamic simulations of Milky Way-like objects, like this is from the Apostle simulation, so all of 2016, they saw something pretty similar. And this shows up in the luminous fraction of galaxies as a function of their redshift zero mass. And what you saw is that around Vmax of 30, you start to run into halos that don't have a galaxy in them. Okay? And it drops down to about 0% pretty quickly over about a decade of mass down to like 10 to the 9. And this works pretty well with our perception of how the local group looks because the galaxies in this region right here would not be prevented from having stars by reionization. They would just have their star formation suppressed or cut off by reionization. And the galaxies that form in here would be the ultrafaints of the Milky Way, which as we can see from the star formation history of one of these Tom Brown, uh, form most of their stars at very early times, like basically before mentioned six, right? And so once again, we have this very clear picture about how the, 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 the simulations and observations mix together uh, to form a, a, a sort of uh, a picture of how reionization uh, should suppress star formation in the local group. But a couple things have changed in, in very recent times. One is uh, the number of small galaxies that we've seen around the local group from Josh Simon's recent review, and I would thank him for actually putting this uh, plot in a paper uh, instead of, uh, before then I had to like steal it from like Andrew's presentation and stuff like that. But um, this is the number of galaxies that have been discovered as a function of time. Um, and you know, throughout most of history, uh, we only knew of dwarf galaxies from photographic surveys, and so these are the classic dwarf galaxies of the Milky Way. But then once digital sky surveys started happening, like SDSS and then DES, you see these huge jump ups, right? And now we have where we had about 10 before digital sky surveys. Um, we now have about 60, so a factor of six increase in the number of galaxies that we know of. Simultaneously in simulation land, once we started to get these uh, hydrodynamic simulations of the Milky Way-like systems, we started to notice something very interesting with the sub halo so it turns out that the actual formation of a gas disk itself adds a non-trivial uh, tidal field that can actually tear apart small subhalos. So what this is, is this is some plots of the subhalo distribution from dark matter only simulations in the Milky Way. This is from Garrison Kimball, 2018. On the left is a dark matter only simulation, and on the right is a fire hydrodynamic simulation. Um, and, and there doesn't seem to be too much of a difference on very large scales. There is, but it's hard to see in these plots. But it comes, becomes pretty obvious when you zoom in on the inner 50 km. When you zoom in there, you can see that there are a lot fewer subhalos very close to the Milky Way than in the dark matter early simulation. And it's because the disk of the Milky Way is tearing apart very small subhalos that pass too close. Now I'm going to quantify this. Uh, this is some, from some work that we did. Um, looking at the subhalo disruption, and so this is the number of subhalos as a function of radius for two samples of simulations. So we took dark matter only simulations of Milky Way size halos and asked how many subhalos did they have as a function of radius. Um, and then in addition to that, we uh, took these simulations and added in an analytic disk potential. So what we did was we put in a potential at the center that grew with the mass and uh, scale radii of the actual Milky Way. So you can simulate, simulate this disk disruption without having to deal with all of that annoying star formation physics and stuff like that. And we recovered the result from the hydrodynamic simulation where there's about a five times suppression of subhalos at 100 kiloparsecs and about a 10 
times expression of some halos uh, at uh, 20 kiloparsecs. And there's this uh, kind of a radius of about 20 kiloparsecs where you wouldn't really expect anything at all. So now, if we think about this missing satellites problem again, we have this scenario where we have more galaxies because of SDSS and DES, and fewer halos because the, the actual disk of the Milky Way can't destroy these sub -halos. So I'm going to look at this again, kind of revisit this idea of reionization killing galaxy and suppressing galaxy formation. And we can come up with a good uh, qualitative idea of how to picture this, how to frame this, by looking at these two plots. So this is the V-peak distribution of subhalos within that end up within the Vera radius of the Milky Way at of zero. So this is the most massive those subhalos ever were, presumably before they fell into the Milky Way. And this is the distribution of those subhalos. So if we look at things, uh, the classical satellites, so the largest things that we could see before SDSS, there's about 10 of them. And you could fit these all in about 30 kilometer per second halos, which works with that canonical suppression scale where you would expect things to start being affected by reionization. Okay. And then if you look at the known satellites, we now know of about 60. Now, you have to fit these things into like 30, 20 to 18 kilometer per second halos. Right? So once again, this is in this tail of the distribution, and most of the new galaxies that were discovered were ultrafaints. So it works with these galaxies being suppressed by reionization. But remember that this is the known satellite distribution. And there's huge completeness issues with the known satellite distribution. Because we haven't surveyed all of the sky, and we certainly don't have radial completeness out to the real radius for the very small DS ultrafaints. Okay? So some people have attempted to correct for this. Uh, there's a wide distribution because there's a lot of assumptions that go into these models. But uh, some examples of this are Toller 2008 or Newton. 2018, where they try to take the known population of satellites and then correct for it. And when you do that, you get basically 100 to uh, 700 satellites, depending on the assumptions that you make. And now, we have to fill in subhalos between the peak. Up to, if, if we're really unlucky, we get a ton of satellites, or maybe really lucky to get a ton of satellites. Um, we have to fill halos down to basically 8 kilometers per second which is down in this tail of the distribution where you basically wouldn't expect to have any galaxies at all. Okay. So I want to look this in a little bit more depth using our simulations. So I constructed this toy model where I just filled galaxies, gave galaxies some probability of being, or halos, some probability of being filled with a galaxy. That's what this F galaxy parameter is as a function of V-peak. And I took this blue distribution as the canonical model. Um, and I just applied it to our simulations. Specifically, the simulations have been about 50 kiloparsecs, because that's where we think we might be complete in the survey volumes of SDSS and DES to very faint ultrafaints. And I wanted to just compare them to the actual observed distribution. So if I take this toy model and apply it to the simulations and then mock observe them with like an SDSS or and DES like field, you get this distribution. So this is Median number of subhalos that you would expect within 50 kiloparsecs given this model, and you can see whoops, you can see that it's less than one. So on average, for our simulations with subhalo destruction, you would expect less than one satellite within 50 kiloparsecs. But we know of 12, so it's a little bit of a mismatch. And the top of this distribution is not like some 60 percentile range or something like that. That's the maximum over all of our simulations, over all rotation, orientation angles, and probabilities of filling halos of the galaxy. And at most, with this model, you get something like five galaxies within the particular parsecs. All right? Now, in order to fix this, you'd have to just, well, fix this, quote, unquote. Uh, you could drop this by about 10, uh, 10 kilometers per second to a model where you start to run out of galaxies at like 15 kilometers per second. And then you got to get a distribution that looks pretty similar to what we would uh, we actually observe. It's still a little bit low, but still well within the minimum and maximum distributions. Okay. And this is a bit weird. And the reason why it's a bit weird is if you look at the virial temperatures of these halos, basically if you take the V peak of these halos 
and then ask what is the temperature of gas that you would expect to be created on these halos. Um, they kind of form a, uh, they kind of bisect this 10 to the 4 Kelvin uh, limit. And this is an important limit. This is actually the atomic cooling limit. Right, so halos above this limit are able to cool their gas via atomic cooling, and then halos below this limit are able to cool their gas via either molecular cooling or metal cooling. And if you look at sort of canonically how uh, we believe the first galaxies formed, the way that we think that this worked is that population three stars formed at very high redshift with these molecular cooling halos. Okay, and then. Uh, at later times, the first galaxies formed in much larger halos, atomic cooling halos. And what we can see by just comparing simulations and observed data from DES is that that might not be true. You might be required to fill galaxies or put galaxies in halos that are below the atomic cooling, which is a bit of a change in the way that we perceive how this happens. Now, I've helped, we, we, we submitted this paper in the fall, and since then, a couple of very interesting simulation, work, uh, simulation works have come up, uh, looking at the formation of galaxies in very small halos. So this is a paper by Coral Wheeler, who uh, looked at very high-resolution simulations of dwarf galaxies. These are uh, simulations with star particles of 30 solar masses, also known as the size of an actual star. Um, and they looked at, basically, what is the smallest thing that we get? Where, where, where's the smallest halo that we get star formation, among other things? Um, and these are the hosts here. This uh, the M10Q, M10B, and M9 are the host halos. But you get a bunch of satellites or other halos for free within the simulation volume. And they actually form a few thousand solar mass things in these very small halos. Um, and their halo mass functions go down quite a bit below this, right, because you just keep forming halos. And there actually is active star formation in some of these very small halos. The problem is we're not quite sure that we can resolve star formation in these very low halos. So you do, yes? So this is pop three to star formation? It's just this is just basically the simplest thing. You have gas, um, and once it reaches a density, it spawns a star particle with a metallicity of minus four. So this is like we just completely ignore pop three star formation. Right? So, um, even more interesting is this uh, simulation by Farah Munshi, where they also looked at uh, simulations of dwarf galaxies with the Chenga code. And they got something very interesting. They looked at specific models of cooling, so adding in molecular cooling and adding in uh, metal cooling. And you can see this molecular cooling run, which is very inefficient in small galaxies. They still get galaxies in halos below 10 to the 8 in halo mass. Um, and they have some star formation at early times here. But what's very interesting is this metal cooling run, and when you add in metal cooling, it just goes crazy, and you're forming all of these galaxies in these very, very tiny halos. So pointing to the fact that maybe you can form galaxies and halos much smaller than we naively thought. But they need metals. But they need metals. So they would need to be enriched from the outside by like a pop three star or something like that, which is kind of how we might think this happens anyway. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, this is the conclusions. I'm finished now. Uh, hopefully that I've convinced you that the local group is interesting, or maybe you were already convinced that was interesting. And uh, there's lots of things that we can do by observing these very small galaxies on the level of single stars. Um, you know, one of the things that I looked at is that, you know, the effect of supernova feedback on the stellar distributions, okay? And uh, saw that, you know, they not only, supernova not only affects the dark matter distribution, but also affects the stellar distribution, and it pushes these stars up to larger radii. And things that have recent star formation have flat age gradients because their stellar populations are more well mixed. Uh, second, I talk about reionization, and we believe there's this classical idea that reionization should suppress or kill galaxies of a certain mass. But the large number of galaxies found by DES, along with some halo destruction seen in small radii, um, might call, give us a reason to rethink this sort of canonical threshold of galaxy formation. All right, that's it. Thank you. Have questions? Let me go. So, uh, your story here, your fifth bullet point, 
there about uh, too many satellites problems now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that uh, that's predicated on the fact that you're, you're growing this disk in the halo and it's destroying. Yes. Um, so, like, how how wedded are you to this story that this is actually the disk is really going to destruction and, and uh, this this sort of you know, this growth of the semi-analytic if you will growth of the disk is 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 um, yeah. yeah. So thank you for asking that question, because there's actually a, a, a secret pocket plot that I had for that. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't actually very convinced. And then uh, with this simulation suite that we had, uh, Tyler Kelly, one of the students at UC Irvine, he wrote this paper where he took the pericenter distributions of the uh, 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 satellites from the simulations and compared them to the uh, pericenter distributions measured by Gaia. And you can see that this is the dashed line is the dark matter only, and the, the solid line is the disk. And the dark matter only ones, basically the pericenter distributions increase kind of arbitrarily down to the very center of the galaxy because there's all of these things at very small radii. But the the disk one has this turnover at around 20 kiloparsecs. And when you plot the actual Gaia observations, these uh, these the red data, it peaks at like the exact same radius, which is really weird. It's one of those things where this, these lines look almost too close to the point that I actually don't necessarily think that I believe them. But it's sort of, it seems clear to me that there is some subhalo destruction going on. And going back even further uh, in the literature, there has, it, it's been pointed out for a long time that the tangential, the distributions, basically the VTAN over VR, the tangential velocities of the satellites in the local group, are a lot larger than the subhalos that you see in simulations. And what the disk does is it disrupts things that are on radial orbits. Oh, so you, I always can tell you that's not necessarily true, right? Okay. Yes, I remember his paper, so I would be interested to hear if he has a counter explanation for this. But you don't have to you don't have to do it now, we're meeting later. But yeah, so this is something that I think is takes me more in the realm of believing it, but initially I was very skeptical because there's a lot of problems with uh, how you resolve stuff and how, how do you resolve subhalos in strong tidal fields. And this is kind of ongoing work about not only how do you resolve them, but how do you even re-identify them in like halo finders and stuff like that. So there's a lot of problems with tidal fields that we currently. So. Yeah, that is of course one way out of this is that all those subhalos that were destroyed are just fake numerical, you know, this numerical destruction and not actual physical destruction. But so the other way out on the observational side is do you have late time movers in any of those simulations? So it gets for classical dwarfs like ten to the ten dwarfs, yes. But once you get down into the ultra faints, those things almost never merge with something else that's so how do you I wanted to hear this because I don't well so the reason why you see too many close ones is they're LMC satellites oh sure yeah so they're LMC satellites yeah so um so you have to have a you know a big merger recently that brought in some friends yeah yes oh that that way is nice to yeah so that's the thing so we looked at basically as far as I know from the uh, few works that have looked at correlating the things that came in with the LMC, basically the DS satellites and found out which things could conceivably fall in with the LMC. Um, it's like 40% of them, 40 to 60, um, and none of those are the ones within the DL process. Oh, there might be one or two that were within the DL process. But it depends on whose model you trust for how the LMC brought in. But yes, that is another way. Um, the other thing is there's some stuff about how many satellites an LMC mass subhalo should have to begin with. And if you look at those, like, an LMC should have a ton of ultrafates around it to begin with. And I think more than what is currently correlated with the LMC in any of those works. So if you assume that, where did those subhalos go? It could just be that they all are satellites of the LMC and we just haven't, uh, we don't have the kinematics to draw all of them back. Yes, that's also the way. Other questions or comments? I have one, but it's just for you correct my ignorance on this whole topic. So when you say supernova feedback literally moves stars out of the core, mm -hmm. how many, I, 
I, I'm trying to wrap that in, in terms of the mass that's in the supernova remnants that are going out relative to the mass of the galaxy itself. So, so we're talking hundreds of supernovae going off in a very small space and a very small galaxy, because otherwise I don't see how you push stars out of the core. What yeah, I so it depends, on, it depends more on how dense the gas is. A lot of, oh, this is the other pocket. Plot. And these are stars that are already formed, or is it, is it pushing the gas? It's stars that, that it are, form? well, okay. So I'm talking about stars that are already formed. There's some, um, so if you look at like the of, like videos of stars, in these simulations, they actually are flung like flung way out. And what's happening in those cases is um, gas. The supernova is actually compressing gas and forming stars in outflows. And so we see that in the simulations. Um, but spe the specific effect I'm talking about in dwarf galaxies is is gradual heating of the orbits by successive feedback. Um, so stars that already form and then subsequently are heated. But you do actually get events of star formation and outflows that shoot stars way out. And you can actually presumably see these in uh, the stellar halo of um, Milky Way. Um, but yeah, so how you actually launch the, those stars to begin with, or, or unbind those stars, change their orbits, um, it actually depends a bit on how, how much you allow the, how dense you allow the gas to get. So a lot of simulations have basically a threshold for star formation. So this is a, what this density is. And this was a paper by Benitez Lambe where they looked at the core formation in simulations based on this density threshold. And you actually can change what you get if you change this density threshold. So if it's incredibly low, if, you, if you're forming stars where the gas is very diffuse, then you don't form a star, uh, you don't form a core because the supernova, uh, the gas doesn't dominate the gravitational but there's this basically sweet spot um, between basically like one centimeter squared per gram or one centimeter cubed uh, density to about well, 100 or something like that, where you allow gas to get dense enough to dominate the dark matter, the, the, the gravitational potential, basically dark matter plus baryons. And when that happens, when you launch the gas out, it drags everything that's in there with it. Okay, And so we don't really know what the correct answer for this threshold means. Because it depends a lot on like, what exactly does it mean to dominate the gravitational potential, and what scale do you need to dominate the gravitational potential to, to launch these feedback events. So, thank you. Any other questions? Scott, let's send Andrew again.